Hi, this is a plan B recording in case uh, live delivery of this keynote uh, doesn't become feasible for some reason. Um, very excited and honored to give this uh, talk. And the charge here is for me to say something interesting and insightful toward next to six years of ACL. Uh, I've been in the field only for uh, less than 20 years, so that's a tall order, no pressure at all. Um, whatever I say, it's likely to be wrong, especially a prediction about future is hard. So minimally, I figured that the theme of this talk should be retro futuristic. And so the background art you see here is created by Jack Hessel uh, to reflect that theme. Um, and then the goal is uh, to share the weirdest and dreamiest thoughts about language and intelligence. Uh, what I figured I shouldn't be doing is stating the obvious, for example, how neural networks are not achieving true natural language understanding. I am going to assume that you and I are already on the same page on that. So skipping all the obvious stuff, I want to uh, try to say things that are a little bit more surreal and different, perhaps counterintuitive, drawing analogy from modern physics that talks about mysterious subjects such as dark matter, Schrodinger's cat, wave particle duality, space-time continuum, and whatnot. And um, in this talk, I'm going to uh, cover uh, not in this order, but common sense, uh, norms and morals, ambiguity of language, learning and unlearning, and the language reasoning continuum, among others. And I'm going to organize that uh, in this particular uh, sequence. So uh, the chapter one will be about the ambiguity, chapter two about the continuum, chapter three about the dark matter. Uh, and then I'm going to end with an epilogue in which I'm going to share my confession as an alien who's not supposed to be here. Okay, so starting with the prologue, what ACL 2082 be like? Uh, might it be in metaverse because uh, due to climate change, maybe we try not to travel anymore and everyone agrees that virtual conferences are not the same, uh, perhaps uh, the experiences will be better. Um, or, Climate change becomes so bad so that we move to Mars. I hope not, but who knows? In any case, what this scientist at ACL might be presenting, will it be still about information extraction? Would you be excited to see synthetic parsing still not being solved yet? Uh, I don't know if I want to see few shot prompting, to be honest. Um, and perhaps uh, the field would have evolved so that instead of information extraction, we now do insight generation and synthesis. Instead of just the synthetic parsing, perhaps we will be doing pragmatic parsing. Instead of a few shot prompting, perhaps a zero shot hyperparameter tuning so that nobody needs to do hyperparameter tuning anymore. Uh, machine comes up with the best tuning uh, on its own. Uh, maybe MT will be about AI language to human language, who knows? Um, perhaps the summarization works so well so that actual ACL papers, at least the surveys, might be written by AIs. And maybe one of the theme might be about how AI is still hitting the wall. Um, or maybe none of this is a moot point. If quantum computing becomes real, uh, in which case we might have a QPT, which is quantum pre-trained transformers that achieves a perplexity near one. Uh, or we might still have arguments about, oh, AGI is just around the corner, but still didn't come yet. Uh, or uh, we haven't solved the compositionality just yet. So uh, the same arguments that we have today might continue even then, who knows? Okay, so... Uh, let's move to chapter one, but let me first remove my helmet, uh, which was for the theme of the prologue, but not for the rest of the talk. Hey, so I'm back without the helmet. Phew. Okay, so the chapter one will be all about the ambiguity. 
um, in modern physics, I realized the more scientists understand, the more ambiguous and weird everything seems to get. So Schrodinger's cat says, maybe simultaneously alive and dead. I mean, the theory about that cat. Um, wave particle duality, like really? I cannot even uh, wrap my head around that concept. And I thought everything is three or four dimensional, but then uh, the modern string theory talks about how there may be 11th theory, uh, dimension as well. And none of this is for sure. Things get weirder and more ambiguous. It might be analogously that future ACL must embrace ambiguity because that's the nature of deeper understanding of language. Corollary to that will be that understanding is not categorization, which I'm going to uh, explain in a bit. Um, but I actually, this I didn't think that way, uh, this way for a long time. Um, and when Swapa, the amazing Swapa tells me that NLU can't be crammed into categorization such as labeling and classification, didn't really click with my mind right away. So she was definitely ahead of me. Uh, when I began my PhD, especially it looked as if NLU research boils down to categorization of some sort. Um, I mean, even parsing is a structural labeling uh, and even discourse, uh, you know, people try to parse it into labels. So there was a huge emphasis on high inter annotator agreement uh, to the point that people seem to avoid the touching on problems for which it is difficult to, to get high agreement or that people seem to throw away data points for which gold labels are less agreeable. And so it looks almost as if uh, we shouldn't be working on problems for which it's not possible to get high inter-annotator agreement because otherwise it's not scientific enough or something. Um, over the course of a time, I realized that categories, I mean, these concepts of categories are real and they do exist, but their boundaries are never clean cut. So the world is full of bloody categories. Even when you try to submit your paper to ACL conferences, do you always feel the areas are a little bit um, uh, hard to define correct, uh, clearly, and uh, it's a fluid. And again, gender, the concept of a gender, you know, for a long time growing up, I thought it was binary. And then I'm waking to the realization that it's actually fluid. Um, it turns out even linguistic concepts are that way, even the very basic linguistic categories such as a part of a speech text. And the first time I learned about this was due to Chris Manning's uh, presidential address at ACL. And you can also see the written version of it in the Computational Linguistics Journal. Um, and he talks about a, a lot of fun examples, but basically even this is in the continuum. Uh, and there's this uh, paper that has very nice title, Category Squish. Um, in which the author talks about how instead of a fixed discrete inventory of synthetic categories, we might need to adopt a quasi continuum. Um, it's not just about part of a speech as it turns out. So another surprise that I had was in this moment when I was reading uh, this paper about veridicality. It's uh, judgments about whether something happened or not. Uh, in this paper, the authors uh, say veridicality judgment is graded and variable. It's actually foolhardy to assign a unique label to every example. Of course, more context will reduce that uncertainty, but no amount of background information could completely eliminate that ambiguity. And actually acknowledging it was a big surprise to me because I thought we're not allowed to write papers in which we actually report that annotators did not agree. But this is 2015 and I was so surprised I remember this. I really liked the paper, but didn't do anything with that um, for a while. Um, but then uh, amazing other researchers such as Anjali and Yulia Martin and uh, others, um, uh, talked about how uh, this study into bias and the toxicity isn't clean cut either, to the point that um, in their research uh, paper, Anjali and Yulia says, say uh, how human judgments in that domain can be unreliable. Um, and so they develop uh, unsupervised algorithms for that reason, because we cannot really rely on 
perhaps a supervised uh, data for that. I thought, wow, you can do this. Uh, this is so rad. Um, but maybe not everyone is working on bias. So you might think, oh, no, my favorite uh, natural language inference doesn't have that problem. No, it actually does. So uh, Ellie and Tom in their paper talks about how their, uh, the human disagreements are not dismissible as a simply annotation noise, uh, but rather persist even as they add uh, more ratings uh, and even as they add more uh, context provided to the raters. So uh, they propose for more refined evaluation uh, in which perhaps the model should predict the full distribution of what people might uh, consider as plausible labels. Um, but still, um, some machine learning uh, flavored folks might wonder whether, eh, uh, still it's better to ignore these cases perhaps because machine learning models might prefer more clean cut cases. Uh, it turns out that's not true either. Uh, so Amazing Swapa um, came up with this idea for data set cartography with really surprising and counterintuitive, uh, perhaps counterintuitive empirical findings such that these data points in the ambiguous regions are the juicy ones for teaching models so that they become more robust for out of distribution examples. Um, and building on this, uh, 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 insights. We then had the follow-up paper with Amazing Alisa. Uh, we, here we uh, have um, uh, automatic ways to create even more similar examples to those ambiguous cases. Uh, and we, to our big surprise, uh, we find that the resulting data set Wangni, uh, even though it's considerably smaller than MNLI, uh, can improve the performance on seven out of a domain uh, distribution test sets. Uh, so this is very exciting. Uh, the machines do need to see these hard ambiguous examples. Um, but these are still just doing simple classification, which in itself is not satisfactory enough. So uh, Rachel Rudinger and co-authors uh, worked on the defeasible version of natural language inference such that given premise and entailment. Here, the premise is about a group of people sitting around a, a table having papers, laptops uh, in front of them. And so what are they doing? The entailment, this is actually example from SNLI. Uh, the entailment is that they are having a meeting. Who knows if they are having a work meeting or not? If they're in a conference room, more likely true. If they're in a library, probably less likely that's true. So you can think about what additional context might defeat the original inference. And so that's delta NLI or defeasible NLI. Uh, and then even building on that, uh, the amazing uh, Faize and co-authors uh, looked at the uh, explanation version of delta NLI in which we learn to uh, reason about the explanations in addition to the uh, classification itself. Um, and then uh, MBIG QA, this is another really great example. Uh, the amazing Sewon and co-authors study how uh, QA problems can often be inherently ambiguous because it's really difficult to ask a very precise question in one go. So they have this really uh, innovative idea to create QA data sets in which you can take turns to resolve that ambiguity. Really great idea. So in sum, uh, if we really want a machine that really understands, it cannot just be doing categorization because it's never enough. And so I deeply understand what Swapa says now that NLU cannot be crammed into categorization, totally. Um, you might have noticed that I've been using the word ambiguity ambiguously to maximize the point about ambiguity. Uh, you gotta be meta and am be ambiguous about the wording ambiguity, meaning I've been using different meanings throughout different slides, but together um, I am licensed to, licensed to do so because uh, it turns out the stars aligned and uh, 
the amazing Barbara Grosch in her PhD thesis uh, million years ago, 1977, uh, she quoted this um, from Louis Thomas' The Lives of the Cell, Lives of a Cell, in which it says, ambiguity seems to be an essential, indispensable element for the transfer of information from one place to another by words where matters of real importance are concerned. So when things are really important, ambiguous tends to kick in. And so um, as a field, maybe we do need to grow to embrace it further. Okay, so that was a um, big speculative, very subjective um, arguments for embracing the ambiguity. Now, the next up is the continuum. So the weird thing about, uh, again, modern physics is that, oh, space time is in this continuous, uh, continuum manifold and, uh, and so forth. So I'm thinking more and more lately that language knowledge and reasoning is in this continuum manifold as well. Uh, in this talk, I'm not going to talk about all three though. Uh, let me focus just on language and reasoning continuum. Um, so language models are amazing, but sometimes. So if you ask the following question to GPT-3, if you travel west far enough from the west coast, you will reach the east coast or not? So GPT-3 in this case it says, oh, the world is round, so you can reach to the east coast. And so the answer should be true. This is all correct. Very impressive sometimes. Um, but, um, you know, if you ask other questions and keep asking, drilling into the similar questions, then you find all sorts of inconsistencies, which makes us wonder, does it, any, does it know anything clearly at all? Um, so GPT-3s are like lemons uh, to date, so very juicy lemons, but nonetheless, they are lemons. So. Um, other researchers reported the bogus explanation that GPT-3 generates, and then how we can uh, make better use of that um, by creating some filters. But um, in this talk, uh, let me talk about yet another way by uh, getting philosophical and use Socrates' myuric method. Okay, so myuric prompting, uh, is uh, what we are going to be, uh, so as a uh, running concrete example, let's use the same question as before. If you travel west far enough from the west coast, et cetera. Um, in order to probe GPT-3, uh, first we use true as an answer and then say because that, 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 so the GPT-3 now has to explain why the answer might be true. Um, and in this case, it says the earth is round. If you travel in any direction long enough, you will eventually return to where you started. This is actual GPT-3 output, which is correct and impressive. But let's just see if GPT-3 really knows by trick and uh, asking trick question in which we replace true with the false. So the answer is not false, but we pretend uh, maybe it's false and then let GPT-3 explain. Uh, now, GPT-3 is trying to be agreeable and say, that, ah, yeah, you cannot reach the East Coast, whatever. So we ask two different true and false uh, situation and then gathered this explanation, which we are going to call as explanation T and explanation F. Um, and then let's dig more into explanation T. So the Earth is round if you travel in any direction long enough, you will eventually return to where you start. Um, so we're just uh, asking GPT-3 exactly what it generated in the previous turn and then see whether it can agree with it and it actually agrees true, okay? But what if we uh, ask the same question but negate it? So we answer, insert this negator, you will not, and then it correctly uh, changes or flips the uh, true-false assignment. This is good. So that means GPT-3 is being logically integral, at least with respect to ET, the explanation that supports the true answer. Um, but what about the explanation corresponding to false answer? So in this case, it turns out if we ask uh, the question, so this is explanation F and negated EF, uh, where it's negated um, from cannot to can, uh, it turns out GPT-3 is not able to flip the answer, which means G 
GPT-3 is unsure about the bogus thing that's said here. So GPT-3 seems to know enough so that what it said earlier is suspicious. So this part is not logically integral, which is a good thing. Uh, you can imagine that we can keep doing this recursively down the uh, tree to explore uh, whether it can further um, uh, support or negate uh, the explanations to the explanation to the explanation. So this is the uh, resulting myotic tree in which we explore uh, true and false explanations. And at this point, um, we already removed a lot of logically non-integral subtree, but still things are potentially inconsistent. So um, in this work, we look at both uh, node level confidence score as well as pairwise uh, consistency relations based on natural language inference. And then um, reason about the entire graph collectively through weighted max set uh, uh, solver. So it's basically classical AI uh, search problem, uh, especially constrained optimization problem. And um, here, uh, the resulting output might be uh, the Q node is assigned as a true, et cetera. And the resulting answer should be just what the top node says. Uh, of course, uh, instead of doing this crazy max set, you could have tried things like a chain of thought. So these are recent uh, approaches or self-consistency, which do much better than the canonical prompting, the very basic one, which does barely better than chance. So this is true false question. So the random would be 50 and uh, recent prompting method, such as chain of thought that sort of ask a lot of questions and then average them out. Uh, those improve the performance a lot, but not as much as the full myotic prompting uh, followed by the collective inference. So it's quite interesting how much gain can we get out of GPT-3 lemon when you plug in uh, the old good stuff, uh, such as Maxiset. Uh, in fact, it's so good, it's better than even supervised model uh, on Google T511B, which is generally very hard to beat based on few shot on GPT-3, but here uh, we can do that. And it turns out similar results repeat in other data sets such as Crick and Com2Sense. These are really fun, recent common sense benchmarks. Um, and we see similar trend here that uh, myuric prompting can boost the performance considerably. So takeaway message here so far is that Socrates' myuric method not only enhances flawed human reasoning, so by the way, human reasoning is also flawed, uh, computational interpretation of it can dramatically enhance flawed GPT-3's reasoning as well. But um, you know, some might still uh, think, ah, this is too symbolic to my taste. You know, uh, some of the younger generation really like anything differentiable. Um, so can we do more differentiable reasoning instead of classical constraint or symbolic uh, satisfaction? So here comes cold decoding of that nature, which is energy-based controlled text generation with Langevin dynamics. So energy. Um, is um, the concept that describes the state of the system of interest. And in our case, it may be controllable text generation. And so what can we uh, express through energy is, for example, fluent generation by conditional probability. Uh, here, we're looking at the soft version of it um, uh, because everything will be differentiable and we're going to be in the continuous space even for worse. Uh, or intermediate representation of words. Um, so there's that, but oftentimes for controllable text generation, we want to add additional constraints like a keyword constraints, which might uh, control the topic of the text output. So if you add that, then the shape of energy function changes and um, the optimal uh, point might be at a different place, of course. And then you can even add, um, additional constraints uh, such as 
How about somehow conditioning on the future, even though you can usually only condition on the past if you're using left to right language model, but if you want to incorporate the future context using left to right language model, then you can throw in additional term there. So all of these are some parts uh, of what we could potentially express through an energy function, which is quite flexible. Uh, and then we could use a Boltzmann distribution uh, in order to convert uh, energy, uh, unnormalized energy uh, into normalized distribution. The reason why we might want to think about the normalized version is if we want to do sampling. So uh, a lot of modern text generation relies on sampling. Uh, if we want to do sampling though, it's really non-trivial from energy, uh, complex energy function. Um, in fact, easy to write this equation, but really hard to compute because Z, the normalizer is intractable. And oftentimes the people talk about MCMC, but it's gonna be too slow. It's not gonna work for us. Uh, fortunately, there's a better version of this uh, based on Langevin dynamics, dynamics. So if we are willing to operate in a very, very continuous space, give up discreteness of language through this uh, reasoning, as, uh, reasoning uh, duration, then Langevin dynamics, which previously has been used for uh, images and audio, now becomes a possible uh, solution. So we use that um, in order to basically try to optimize this energy function through this very simple equation where we take gradient and we keep iteratively updating this. And then the final soft representation, now these are uh, going to be weird representation that's not quite the same as the continuous version of a word dictionary. So there's a bit of a trick there. But that's basically what we're doing. Uh, we tested on three very different uh, common sense reasoning benchmarks in which we are required to generate text. And uh, we see promising results here. More results in the paper, but let me wrap up there. And so this continuum segment, I began with this um, tri triangle, not just language and reasoning. Uh, a little more discussion is shared in my recent Dadalus journal. I was uh, honored to contribute an article there in the special issue on AI and society, uh, publicly available online now. Um, some of you might have seen me raving about this book, The Enigma of a Reason by Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber in which the authors argue how reasoning is a mechanism of intuitive inferences in which logic plays at best a marginal role and so forth. I'm not going to uh, talk much about this. I'll just uh, throw a pointer there, but would like to highlight other very interesting work such as uh, uh, language-based reasoning for uh, deduction or entailment uh, in which basically understanding requires reasoning and reasoning requires understanding. Um, and then um, there's another form of a reasoning called abduction. Uh, so here generation requires a reasoning and reasoning requires generation. And I don't know uh, if abduction is what everyone knows these days, but back in 2013, when I was attending Lifetime Achievement Award uh, speech by Jerry Hobbs, I didn't know what this word really meant, but he said something amazing, which is that the brain is an abduction machine, continuously trying to prove abductively that the observers, uh, observa observables in its environment constitute a coherent situation. Abduction is reasoning about the probable explanation of a partial observation due to Charles Peirce, it turns out. So this is what I had to look up. Um, and in the same talk, which by the way is available in the linguistics uh, journal, article shown here, uh, it talked about stuff like knowledge, common sense knowledge, the answer is abduction. So this is 2013 before I began working on common sense. And uh, I found this very um, inspiring, not knowing that I would actually really seriously invest into it in later years. Okay, so that's a good segue to the next chapter, the dark matter. Um, so the dark matter is what does matter in modern physics. Uh, it turns out only 5% of universe is normal matter that's actually visible. 
the remaining 95% is either dark matter and dark energy, which is completely invisible. But how do we know that they're there? Well, because they do influence what are visible. They change the orbits of stars and the, they even change the trajectory of light. So I feel there's a dark matter of language as well, in the sense that no, normal matter for NLP is visible text. So we worked on parsing and tagging all this visible stuff, but really there's a dark matter that really influences the way we use language and we interpret language. So this is the unspoken rules about how the world works, some of which is a great deal about common sense, knowledge, and reasoning. Um, so let me share our recent work on generic induction uh, that is uh, the sequel to our previous work, Symbolic Knowledge Distillation, uh, that focused on distilling general language models to common sense, causal common sense models to appear at Knuckle this year. Let me give you just one page summary of what this was about. So we started with GPT-3 in this case. Uh, we built this pipeline of distillation mechanism such that in the end, we were able to create a new common sense knowledge graph uh, at least for the causal com <coughs> common sense relations, we had a uh, first machine authored machine authored knowledge graph that wins uh, over a human authored KB in all criteria: scale, accuracy, and diversity. Um, but you know, one thing I was a little sorry was that uh, can we get anywhere without GPT three? Though, how come everything is using GPT three these days? Can we do anything out of GPT two? Uh, or a smaller model. Um, so here in generic induction, the task, our focus will be about generic knowledge in the form of generics, such as birds can fly. And that uh, generalized knowledge that requires a bit of inductive reasoning. And so the question is, can we distill such inductive knowledge or generics from language models, especially much worse one like GPT-2? So given a concept like a bicycle, what we do is we first generate some uh, beginning of a nice sentences like a bicycle can, bicycle has. These are generic templated the beginning of a sentences. And then we're going to do constraint decoding from uh, GPT-2, in particular using our neurologic a star -esque decoding mechanism where you can throw in logical constraints to control uh, a bit of a synthetic and uh, semantic patterns of your language generation. So this is of the, uh, this is a plug and play method that can be used on, on top of any off the shelf language models without any additional fine tuning. So using that, uh, we do this uh, uh, control the text generation to generate what appears to be generic, like, you know, at least in the style of the language, it looks like a generic, but, um, if we generate this from GPT-2, it's guaranteed to be very, very noisy. So for example, it generates bicycles are also pedal. Ugh, this is just wrong. So then what do we do? Well, we create a simple critic or classifier based on Roberta. They can learn to throw out suspicious ones. The critic is not that high quality, but it really can still uh, throw out a lot of bad ones together with the good ones, but it's better at catching bad ones. Um, but even after then, it's not going to be perfect because some of this uh, knowledge that's not yet filtered out might be a uh, contradiction to each other. So we can then try to remove such contradictions by running in, in natural language inference models over all the pairs, and then again, run max set solver that we uh, saw earlier in a different context. Uh, and then it turns out the resulting knowledge becomes now much more consistent. Um, you might wonder how well does GPT-3 do? Uh, is it already pretty good at it? The answer is, uh, especially GPT-3 Da Vinci, especially the new instruct version or also known as GPT-3 text, that's really good, but ours win over that. So when you look at this precision recall curve, uh, our uh, green line, which is just critic combined with um, GPT-2 and neurologic decoding does much better than GPT-3. 
Um, so that's very exciting because um, uh, we can do so much more, uh, even with GPT-2, if we improve the algorithms, the reasoning algorithms. Okay, so compared to the previous resource called generic KB, uh, here Y axis shows the quantity and green bar is correct portion, black is the noisy portion. Uh, right off the bat after GPT-2, it's very bad, 40%, uh, only 40% is good. But after critic, after throwing out so many good stuff together with the bad stuff, we still have a very large amount of generic knowledge gathered uh, while maintaining accuracy as high as 87%. And that's better than the previous generic KBS accuracy, which was based on information extraction from the web corpus. So we now have a new uh, avenue to explore for the purpose of generic uh, or inductive knowledge distillation from uh, language models. Um, so new resource, uh, smaller models can do really much better if we put uh, more uh, informed or smart algorithms on top. Okay, so, so far we talked about common sense, but I alluded earlier that that's not the whole picture. Uh, in fact, ethics and morality um, are really relevant when we think about uh, language understanding and uh, language technologies. Um, and it was foreseen by uh, Barbara Grosh in her lifetime achievement in uh, award speech in 2017, where she uh, shared her concern about these potentially life-threatening errors in dialogue systems. And she emphasized the importance that well, the capabilities for collaboration cannot be patched on uh, and it must be designed in from the start. So uh, ethics also must be taken into account from the start of the system design. And this is really forward looking thing in 2017, when not as many people as now were working on uh, how to detect hate speech and toxicity and address gender bias and all of this. So I'm very excited. This is, by the way, only a small subset of this um, explosive uh, literature that I am enjoying uh, uh, noticing uh, lately, especially I think last year or two, this have been really going upward, uh, super exciting. Uh, on our end, we worked on Delphi as, um, uh, experimental common sense moral models. We have a new archival paper uh, to come out soon. We, we've been working on just revising this paper for six months, during which we didn't submit uh, the, the article anywhere. We actually, we only recently, uh, a couple of days ago, we did finally. Um, but um, yeah, this is another attempt at it. And um, in the meanwhile, we've been also exploring uh, positive use of Delphi as um, more foundational uh, prior model or foundation model models for uh, learning or acquiring social norms and uh, values in a game environment. Um, so that's another uh, use case uh, to appear at Knuckle, where we use reinforcement learning to uh, explore uh, more socially beneficial behaviors for agents in, in that environment. Uh, another exciting work that I, I would like to share is pro-social dialogue, where we trained this uh, model canary that detects when dialogues uh, requires uh, some sort of uh, safety intervention um, from humans. So, uh, the canary is powered by Delphi because there's not a lot of horrible dialogue data set for which we can train strong models to detect uh, horrible situations. So um, that's another positive use case of Delphi. And um, last not but least, we all know that language models today are toxic because of the raw data that is toxic to begin with. And that raises this question of, can we do on learning? So here we explore controllable text generation through reinforced on learning. And QUARK uh, is acronym of quantized reward conditioning. Um, 
And the big picture story goes something like this. Language model is pre-trained and it can generate some stuff. So let it explore by generating some stuff, some of which will be bad. So we're going to use Google's perspective API to give scores about how toxic they are. Um, and then we quantize the reward because otherwise reinforcement learning is known to be very unstable when the reward has a high variance. So to lower the variance, we quantize it. Um, and then we rotate this loop of exploration and exploitation. And basically the more we rotate, the better the language model becomes. Um, this is a version of online off a policy reinforcement learning, if you want to know specific flavor of this reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, when tested on real toxicity problems, um, we do considerably better than previous approaches. And in fact, our quirk method uh, is even better than PPO. This is another recent flavor of RL, which is very powerful, uh, but ours does even better. Um, it also dramatically improves the fluency itself. So we can reduce toxicity without hurting fluency as much. Um, this is general method. You can uh, try for unlearning negative sentiment or even unlearning uh, degeneracy of language models for, for example, repeating text over and over. And we found that the same approach can be applied to different types of unlearning requirement. Okay, so finally, let me share my confession as an alien. Uh, why am I even here? I really could have not imagined that 10 years ago or any number of years ago, I would come this far. I consider myself as a case of a late bloomer and I grew to believe that talent is made, not born. Uh, that requires a bit of explanation. I think there are two factors, internal factor and external factor. Let me begin with internal factor. And because I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I didn't think much of myself, I was doing two things correctly, unintentionally. One is that I was willing to do lifelong learning. Uh, I, I always felt like I, I need to learn more and I would learn from everyone, especially from my own students, from uh, with whom I spend the most time with, um, and continually revising my beliefs and perspectives along the way. So I, I keep revising what I believe, and I think this was a really good thing for me. Uh, taking risk is another thing that I, looking back, I realized it was a good thing. I didn't realize that, you know, actually, it would have that kind of benefit that I received later on. But my reason back then was that, well, I'm not that great. I shouldn't work on problems that other smarter people will work on because that's a total waste of tax money. You know, professor salary comes from tax oftentimes. Well, if you work on in, in a public university, that is. And um, I felt that it's a waste of that money because someone else can do a better job than I do. So I figured I should try to contribute by working on some other stuff that people are not working on. And I also figured that since I'm not that great, who cares if I fail, nobody will notice. As it turns out, 10 years is such a long time to learn about really a lot of stuff. And um, it's actually pretty impossible to only fail in that entire 10 years, you know, only failing one after the other, that's just impossible. You eventually start creating things that do work out. So that's the internal factor. But that alone doesn't work. If it were not that, uh, I was lucky enough to be in an inclusive environment. This, I cannot un, uh, overemphasize how important this was. So I really truly believe now the power of diversity and inclusion for two reasons. One is that the culture that understands the DI uh, is less authoritative in general, I, I believe, and more open-minded, which in turn helps people like me to grow confidence, to try something new and different, which is really important. Taking risk, I think is very important for a uh, scientist. And then uh, you also learn so much more. I didn't realize, uh, but now I know. When you interact with the diverse folks, they really broaden your worldviews, viewpoints, and then also foster more diver divergent and innovative thinking. So all in all, I benefited so much from diverse folks. I thank so much, especially Claire Cardi, who convinced me to apply 
to faculty job market when I really wasn't going to if she didn't insist on that. So thank you so much. And Luke, Ray, Dan, who believed in me in all the years of my career when it seemed like really there was no reason to. And the wonderful colleagues at UW and AI too, I owe uh, all of, to all of these people so much. Um, and thank you so much for uh, the co-chairs of the pro, uh, ACL. Um, I don't know how I got in here, but thank you so much for your kind invitation to uh, give me the opportunity to speak. Um, my heroes and role models, this is only a small subset of wonderful uh, long list of um, uh, heroes that I learned so much from, uh, although I'll bite from distance. And then uh, the early students and postdocs in my group, I don't even know what they were thinking when they joined my group back then, but thank you so much for giving me the chance to work with you, learn from you, my current students, uh, my uh, current postdocs and colleagues at AI2, um, even more collaborators across the world, uh, and then uh, former interns uh, with whom we had a lot of fun research. And so thank you so much. And now I'm uh, ready for questions. <laughs>